There we go. All right. So welcome everybody to Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020, the school board workshop. It's a Zoom conference yet again, um, 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday night. We're gonna start um, with instructional programming. <clears throat> Heather, I think we added a special business meeting. I don't know if you you have the update, but we have a um, I didn't get that a staff person that we need to approve. Okay, so, I was wondering how we we're going to do that. I don't know why I missed that. Okay, so we are starting with a special board meeting. So do we want to do a call to order and then the flag salute and then um, just go into the vote for the um, yeah the, the candidate and then end that meeting? Okay and then start this one. All right, so thank you for that. Do I need to recall a special business meeting? Yeah, okay. So welcome to the special business meeting, school board business meeting on September 22nd, 2020. Thank you all for being here at 6.30 Tuesday night via Zoom. If we can all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. It's getting dark, Donna. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I it. pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of, of the United, United States, States of, America. of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. So are we going through the whole adjustments to the agenda or just going straight to a vote? No, it's, it is on the agenda. Um, so we need a motion. Okay, so just go straight to the motion. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve Alan Werner for the Ponco fourth grade teaching position. May I have a second? I second that, Kimberly. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, any comments or discussion? Donna, can you speak to this position? Uh, this is a position, a fourth grade, and right now it's a remote position, um, but it's a fourth grade teaching position to replace Kate Whipple, who has resigned to take a position in another district. Um, I was not in on the interviews, but Jason was. Jason, do you want to say anything about um, Ellen? Sure, thank you, Donna. Uh, yes, we're really excited to welcome Ellen uh, to our team. Uh, she um, is currently working in New York and she works for, um, for Success Academy Charter Schools. And she, is, um, she has experience teaching in the classroom throughout the year. She has extensive experience planning and developing um, online and remote learning opportunities. Uh, very interesting conversations with her about um, remote field trips and, and all sorts of exciting stuff. Uh, the um, search committee just act absolutely connected with her really well and um, feel, feels like she's going to be a really great addition to our team. So we're excited for tonight. She got her master's degree in, uh, at uh, Teachers College in Columbia. Yes. So that's very exciting. Uh, uh, New York City, so that's very exciting for us. Um, yeah, we do a lot of work with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long, long list of of um, great achievements and and credentials. So we're excited. Okay, are there any questions from board members? All right. So seeing no questions, let's go ahead with a vote. Heather Altenberg is a yay. I may be out of order here, but Kimberly Carr? Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura is not here, so Phil Saucier? Yay. Okay. And so the next uh, motion would be a motion to adjourn. Yeah, may I have a motion, please? I move we adjourn. Thank you, Kimberly. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Hope. Um, so Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. 
Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. Uh, Phil Saucier. Yay. Okay. I can't seem to, I'm trying to connect them. Okay, so now we move into the workshop, correct, Donna? Correct. Okay, so in the workshop, um, I need your thing then. Just put them in and then click that thing. Will you click it? Yeah. Uh, so then we're gonna go to the remote learning. Please, sorry, I'm having technical difficulties that my husband's trying to help me figure out as we do this, my apologies. So uh, I was gonna do a little introduction if that's okay. That's fantastic, take it away. Okay, so just to remind people of where we are, um, we've completed our two weeks of professional development with our teachers in the building, and Kathy Stanker did an amazing job pulling together two weeks of professional development. Um, it focused on remote learning, um, diversity and equity, um, social-emotional learning, uh, just many, many different things, as well as all the trainings, the sanitization, hand, hand washing, social distancing, mask wearing, and um, some of the many other trainings that um, are, we're required to provide for our teachers every year. So then we moved into our two weeks of uh, student roll-in. And we, we, um, we thought this was an important um, piece in our planning because we thought it would give people, uh, staff, time to um, test the traffic patterns in the hallways and the technology, um, changes in our entrances and exit, exits as students came and went in very small groups, mask wearing, um, sanitization lunch, lunches are in our schedules. And um, we had many positive comments from, um, from teachers after those two weeks that they were so glad that we had had those two weeks. It gave, gave the students a chance to get to know the buildings and the new um, the up, up, up staircases and down staircases that were marked and the, the arrows in the hallway and, and all of those things that are so so different in our schools. Um, but it gave everybody really a chance to settle in with very small groups of students. It gave us a chance to test our transportation schedules. Um, it looked like we had been having students, uh, parents drop off their students and students enter our buildings. It looked like it was um, a practice that we'd been doing forever, um, even though kids were going in different entrances, it was it was just very organized and very smooth. So, um, I think most most everyone would agree that the the time spent in those two weeks was very valuable. So now we are in our um, reopening stage for our instruction, um, and while we're implementing that st stage, we're also um, Administrators are also starting to plan, um, and hopefully we won't, we said this last year, uh, hopefully we won't have to use this plan, but um, we're starting to talk about what happens if we have to, to um, close our buildings and go to remote learning. So it feels like ever since um, last winter, we've been planning on something, um, but we have started those discussions so that if and when we have to do that, we will be prepared. Um, so the, the principals tonight are going to talk about their um, the hybrid model and the 100% the remote uh, learning model that's going on in their schools. Um, just want to remind people that this was day two of um, of this, uh, the instructional, the full instructional um, part of our scheduling. So uh, I think we had great reports from yesterday, although pe some people found some things that they're gonna go back and tweak. And in our discussion today and in the last uh, couple weeks, um, people have found things that um, they're doing different because of our situation now, but they would like to keep these things. They found out that they work pretty well and um, they've decided, well, let's not go back to the other way we did it. Let's keep this way. So um, I think uh, we'll start with Jason and um, 
You can tell us about what is uh, going on in Pond Cove. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Donna. And I'd like to thank the school board as well for the opportunity to share um, a few more details than I have in the in the past about our hybrid um, model and our elected fully remote model. Um, so if I could um, have permission to share my screen. Um, that sure. would be great. I'll, I'll do that right now, Jason. Thanks. So there's a couple of these slides that will look familiar to you, You're awesome. uh, but they've had, thank you. A couple of the slides will look familiar to you, um, but they're tweaked a little bit and then there are a few new slides. Let's see. Okay. So I'm hoping that everyone can see that. Mm -hmm. We see it. Yeah. All right, let's see. <clears throat> Great, so what I wanted to do tonight is just give a brief um, instructional model update and answer any questions that you might have the, to the best of my ability. As, as Donna said, this is day two. And um, although there has been a lot of time and planning um, and collaboration that have gone into the development of the models, um, and, and although you know, we were um, teaching in the full remote model in the spring, this still is, is new to us. And um, we're really in the refining, refining stages now. Um, so this slide is not new, um, but it's tweaked a little bit. So this is just a general overview for you, just kind of a review of the hybrid model at, at Pond Cove. Um, and I won't go through and read all of this, uh, some of the other slides kind of uh, come back and, and share some of this information as well. But a couple things to point out is that, you know, we did a click curriculum review and, and um, tailored the curriculum this year to fit this model, knowing that there is actually uh, less, less instructional time, of course, um, given, given the hybrid model. So we're really emphasizing reading, writing, and math, but also still teaching science and social studies standards, um, still teaching allied arts, and, and focusing on social emotional learning um, through, through daily instruction as, and also through um, specialized guidance lessons and, and things that Brie Gallagher will be offering. And again, a lot of this will be the same as the full remote, but I will, I will take a look at that. Um, students will have iPads. We are all K-4 um, students and teachers are utilizing Google Classroom. We're providing consistent daily schedules for each student every day. Um, instruction on remote days for hybrid students is primarily asynchronous because their teachers are teaching um, the other cohort live all day long and they, they do not have the ability to um, connect live with uh, the cohort that is learning at home that day. So they put a lot of time and effort into, into preparing um, a, a, an appropriate um, instructional package for their kids, for their students while they're at home. And we are providing RTI still within the hybrid model from our reading and math specialists. So the, the column to the right um, titled schedule. So over there, it specifies that direct instruction, new learning, is delivered Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And further, it, it just defines the maroon and gold. The maroon group is being Monday, Thursday, and the gold group is being Tuesday, Friday. Um, we're still committed to providing three to four hours of activities for K2 and four to five for grades three and four. And Wednesdays, so Wednesdays are, are utilized for student support remote office hours, skill practice, primarily through apps that, will pr that are provided on the iPads, and allied arts videos. So um, Wednesday is really an allied arts day as well. And, and part of Wednesday is for teacher planning, professional development. Um, and um, so let's take a look at now. We're going to go to, so that was the hybrid. So this is the, let's see. I seem to be stuck. Oh, there we go. So this is the elected full remote. And so 
in a little in a little bit i'll tell you about how many students we have in each of these programs so a lot of this is the same as the hybrid so emphasis is the same and so students are still assigned to a classroom but it's a virtual classroom and in some cases as you'll see we have a couple multi-age classrooms the way the numbers worked out still using ipad still using google classroom using zoom and if you go if we look over to the schedule um, column full remote is the same direct instruction in new learning is monday tuesday thursday friday wednesday is still a very productive day um, but it's utilized for that remote support. So some teachers will have office hours. Some teachers will make appointments with students and appointments with parents. Uh, Allied Arts art is still taught on Wednesdays through pre-recorded videos. And also fully remote teachers receive planning professional development. Okay. Let's see. So I want to just show you, if you take a look at this, this shows you our programs and the number of students that we have in each. So if you look at this, so grade level here, so total students enrolled in a grade level for kindergarten is 97. And out of that 97, 14 are fully remote. And we have one, so one fully remote class of 14 students. And then the other 83 students are divided into five classes and the class size is average class size is 16.6 .6. so you could just take a peek at this and this will give you an idea of each grade level you can see that for first graders there's one full remote class of 19 students and then there were so many first graders that wanted to go remote that six other first graders join a, a grade one two multi-age class so the way the numbers worked out we required to create a multi-age one, two. And then we also have um, a full remote class with Mrs. Vita Taylor of 17 third graders. And then there were five additional third graders that have joined a multi-age three, four class. Um, so you can see, oops, sorry. So you can see those numbers there. And, and I'm happy to, um, pause for for questions or just we can go back to these slides if there are questions after so this is a schedule that i sent home to all parents this morning and this i'll send one of these schedules but it's a very simplified way to show um, families what students are doing and all the details of course come from the teachers themselves in their daily communication so you could see that when Maroon's in school, Gold is at home. The academic programming really officially starts for Gold students tomorrow because they were just getting their iPads today. Um, but so this is just a simplified schedule. And what it really points out is that it talks a little more detail about Wednesdays. So if you look at that middle column, you know, these are some of the things that will be happening on Wednesdays. So. The work is really asynchronous, except special education students would be connecting live with, with their special educators. Students receiving math and literacy supports would be connecting live with our RTI teachers. Our guidance counselors are doing, guidance counselors doing live um, work online. And then teacher, classroom teachers are, are doing these things here, making appointments with students, parents, Students are finishing unfinished assignments, completing tasks. Um, and this is just kind of a repeat of before. And I just wanted to show you this. So one of the things that we were, we've talked a lot about is providing students and families with a relatively detailed schedule for the days that they're at home. So I have here an example of a hybrid, hybrid program schedule. Um, and this is an actual schedule that a third grade teacher has sent home to parents. And then I have an example of a full remote program schedule, just so you can kind of see what parents are getting. And this is in general, what we agreed upon as a staff. So I'll open up the hybrid program schedule first. And you can see that. So this teacher is letting students and families know 
um, what the daily in-person schedule. So if you're Maroon and you're at school on Monday, this is the schedule that this third grade teacher is following. So you can see it very much resembles just a full day. Um, we have added a recess. We have two recesses now. Um, and because we really wanted to get kids moving, so you can see going through, it's like a typical elementary schedule. And then teachers are all, were also asked to add a suggested remote learning schedule. So the idea is to map out a full day for students and families, but then also say, if this doesn't match your, your family's schedule and you want to rearrange these activities to meet your needs, that's okay too. So you could see this is what a student would get um, in their Google Classroom in the morning for a day when they're at home. And so it's, it's really highly scaffolded um, in terms of students being able to plan their day and, and be ready for learning. I'll just let you kind of take a look at it and I'll scroll. So again, it doesn't work for all families and families can take the activities and, and create any schedule they want for their children. But this is quite detailed. Um, and again, within Google Classroom, there are links so that students can participate in all these activities and, and clear directions. So then notice this teacher at the bottom, your family is welcome to make a copy and adjust as needed, which I know in my home, that's what we did. We took the teacher schedule and that's what we're doing now. And um, we may make a copy of it and adjust it to fit our needs, but it's nice to have that support coming every day from the teacher. Okay. And this is, so here's an example of a full remote program schedule. Um, so these are students that are elected to be full remote and are working from home every day. This is um, from our current grade three, four multi-age teacher. And so she has set it up so that families have a complete and students have a complete schedule to look at and plan their day out, decide if they need to make any adjustments, even including things like movement and snack breaks, um, which is just so helpful to a lot of parents that just want to be able to tell their child, your teacher said you need to do this and please follow this today. Um, so the idea is to be supportive, but not restrictive so they can make adjustments if they want. Um, and again, this would be an example of a schedule that a student would have, and then all links to all the activities would be under that day in Google Classroom. Um, and I'm gonna move on from that. And I think I have one more, yeah. So um, this is a picture that I took today, and, and I wanna thank Melanie Thomas um, for allowing me, giving me permission to use this. This is her daughter, Stephanie. And so I was in a fourth grade classroom um, this morning and I just happened to look and see that uh, the the class was discussing and working on um, the relationship between division and multiplication and I just noticed that Stephanie had she had her iPad open and using um, the same the same Google Classroom that she'll use at home the next day to continue this learning, uh, but she's doing it in the classroom and she has the whiteboard and, and I just thought it was a perfect image of everything that we we strive for and hope for. So I asked Stephanie if she would mind if um, if I if she pretended she didn't know I was there and I snapped a picture of her and she was great. Um, I also want to point out the little bamboo plant. Um, we'll have to ask Mrs. Merriam about that, but each, each student has a bamboo plant on their desk. It's, it's, they're studying them. Um, I'm not sure if it's science, but so I just wanted to share this and, and um, it's, there are a lot of great things going on in the classrooms and in a lot of ways, although the classrooms look very different, you can see in this picture that there's a lot going on that's very much the same um, as it's always been. So. Um, that's all I have in this presentation, and I'm not sure if there are questions or if there will be, be any questions, or, but I'm happy to answer anything I can. Are there any questions from board members? Simple question, uh, Jason. Yes. So the students 
who are studying at home and the students who go to school, maroon and gold, they don't see one another. Uh, is there any opportunity for any of the students to be in class or other media virtually or online, or they will never know they're going to be sticking for the rest of the year with those particular group? Right. So the, the question, so is the question, um, would maroon and gold ever have time to get together? Online, yes. Not Online, physically. Yes. Online. So, so we've talked a lot about that and we are at this point, um, you know, where we're not doing live streaming from the classroom yet. Um, we are, we are discussing it and have purposefully held off because we're just thinking about, um, live streaming to a classroom at the elementary age and confidentiality. And we're just still having some discussions around that. Um, so one of the things that we have done quite, a, I've been talking to the teachers and quite a few teachers have done this to start with is sending out a Google doc to all the families maroon and gold and parents can voluntarily put their contact information on it if they choose. And then parents could supervise and um, maroon and gold kids could socialize via Zoom that way. Um, that's the first attempt we've made to give, um, to support maroon and gold students getting together. But still, still discuss live streaming into a room for something like example, like a morning meeting with all the kids, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Okay, thank you. That would be really great if we could get to that place where the two cohorts could intermingle for a morning meeting. That would be phenomenal. Yes. Um, I appreciate you being sensitive to the privacy issues and taking it slowly. There's no need to rush into it. Yes. Yes. Right? We definitely, we have a lot of teachers very eager to do that in some, just with some questions. Sure. Yep. Great. Are there any other questions? Well, thanks for that, Jason, and um, congratulations on a great first day and um, uh, day two, can, I guess I should say. Yeah. Can, he, can Jason highlight and just some of the perspective what students are thinking about, uh, especially those who are returning to school, some of thoughts, some ideas, smiles, frowns, yeah. everything above, <laughs> scary. Yeah, so um, they're definitely getting more and more used to school. Um, you, it's harder to see the smiles now, but you can see the smiles in their eyes. Um, I think that, I mean, lots of students are, are reporting to me and lots of parents are saying that things are going, we hear from a lot of the parents that are saying things are going very well. Um, I think it is, it is challenging um, for some students in terms of um, the, the physical distancing and the students that are used to um, just being much closer and and uh, at recess and, and things like that. And it's definitely hard for them, lots of reminders, but we're teaching them like why we're keeping the distance and how, why it's, we need to do that to be safe. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of positive stories, definitely lots of smiles for sure. Thank you. Hey Heather, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, thank you. I don't have a lot of questions about this. I think it, a lot of thoughts gone into the schedule and the way it's work. And I can tell you my two kids have had good experiences with their teachers and the schedule um, so far where I'll try to figure it out. But I think I, I'm very impressed with the way the school is working. This is more of a, uh, uh, just get into the weeds on, on transportation um, and, and how you think the drop off and pickup are going. Um, you know, we, I've had some questions about that with some of my neighbors. We, we used to be busters. We aren't busing because um, initially we thought maybe we, it would be better for the school system not to have um, as many people on the bus. We're starting to think we might go the other way. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, just given the number of cars, particularly at pickup, and you had an email earlier about that this week. So I just want to get your thoughts about that, if, how you think that's going, if there's any you know tweaks that can be made on that. I know it's a challenging mm -hmm. situation, so I, I get that. Just your thoughts on the traffic and that sort of thing. Sure. So, so it appears from, from our perspective, it appears that drop-off seems to be going really well. That seems to be right. 
see be pretty quick and the timing is about the same as years before. Uh, about 8.35, we're able to kind of finish up with drop off. So parent pickup is um, taking longer than it did for a few reasons. Um, one is increased, increased number of students, even though we have, um, you know, 50% of the students in the building, we're having about equal as many parent pickups as we usually did, as we did last year when we had 100% of students in the building. Also following the safety guidelines um, is making pickup take a little bit longer. So we've been working on trying to tighten that up. And there are a lot of different layers to that that are making it challenging. We're, we're, um, first, what we're trying to do is become efficient with the given process that we have. At the beginning of the year, there's always a lot of um, mix-ups, which cause um, the process to take more time. Students are supposed to be on a bus, but they're in the pickup or vice versa. And we're kind of stopping everything and pulling kids in. So we're kind of trying to first iron that out, iron out like our efficiency in the process to see if we need to make any changes. Um, it's definitely getting faster and faster each mm -hmm over time. We're, we're almost to the point where dismissal is ending at the same time as it did last, as it, on an average last year. It's just parent pickup is, is finishing last where last year buses would finish last. So like, for example, last year, we'd usually be done with everything around 317. Yesterday, we were done with everything at 319. So oh, okay. we're, we're right around there, but it's definitely parent pickup is taking longer but we are finishing the entire process almost as quickly as usual. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And of course, we can't control the um, good work being done out on Sky Dyer Road, which I know is a short-term situation. <laughs> it's affected some people yes. too. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yes, and we will, we're gonna continue to work on that. You know, there's a lot we wanna get, we wanna get students to their parents and we want to get staff we, we don't want to extend the day for staff either. So we're really, right. we have a lot of motivation to, to make this a smooth process. Anything else for me? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. All right. All right, so a lot of what I have to share is very, very similar to Jason. Um, and then some of it is quite different just by the nature of middle school versus elementary school and students having one teacher all day or, or one or two versus having five in a day and things like that. So I am going to try and share my screen if- Okay, my man, try. John will give me the power. <laughs> Okay, there you go. All right, can you see that? Yes. Perfect. And of course, I'm on the last slide, so I'm just gonna start on the front. So really quickly, I wanna kinda give you the quick overview. I, I mean, we've been through schedules, we've done all that, nothing's really changed in, in that area. Um, and before I really get started into that, well, well Jason, brought it up or Phil did. Um, our parent drop off and pick up, I think I would put in the checkbox or the column for success. Um, we, we have used three drop off circles. Actually, we have one drop off circle and we've created two more out of parking lots. Um, and it's gone really smoothly, I think. The, the, the efficiency of that has gone, um, has been impressive. And I think, I hope parents feel that as well, but it seems like much quicker in and out and obviously it works different with half of your population versus if we had all the everyone there. But um, so that that I think has been a huge success for us. And then I'm going to quickly share just some numbers. So we we currently have 379 students that opted for the hybrid model, and we have 93 um, students that opted for the full remote. So pretty similar numbers. I think Jason had around 90. So we're pretty similar in that area. Fifth grade off the top of my head had the most with around 28 um, that opted for full remote. And I believe the other ones are all close to 20-ish. And 
Um, we've been really fortunate to have some teachers step up and just volunteer to be the remote teachers um, for, for the content areas for those, for those students. So for our schedule, um, our schedules are all, all based in PowerSchool and can be found in PowerSchool. However, um, PowerSchool is not really designed to do the hybrid model. And in PowerSchool land, you're either on a remote uh, on a maroon day or a gold day. And it really does not recognize the fact that we have kids in both because on a maroon day, they're in school and on a gold day, they're home. Um, so that has been a bit of a struggle, but luckily for us, people in the office is incredible and she just sticks at it and, and is getting it done. So largely periods one through six represent what is often referred to as the core content. Um, and that's the same for hybrid or full remote. And on those periods one through six um, is when students would get their math, language arts, science, social studies, world language. Uh, and for seventh, uh, for seventh and eighth grade students, physical education will also be in person, partly um, for fifth, sixth and eighth grade students. This year, we're able to provide that. And periods one through six represent the same things for fifth and sixth grade. So math, language, arts, science, social studies, and world language, but they also have the addition of makerspace and computer science. And that's nothing new, it's, it's been that way forever. Um, one thing you'll see is we've reduced our periods. There, you, typically we would have seven periods in a day, now we have six. And we really did that in an effort to maximize and gain some time back. Um, so our classes last year were around 47 minutes, this year they're around um, 60 with taking out five minutes for passing, so around 55 minutes. So that was really done in an attempt to gain some of that time back. So the point really to be made there is hybrid or full remote students, periods one through six in their power school schedule, that is their in-person day. And that is their, even if it's full remote, that's when they're working directly with a teacher via Zoom and they're getting those core content subjects. Now periods seven through 12, seven through 12 are the other day. Um, so that is really where a lot of the is happening. And we've had some questions around um, what it means to have independent academic extension. Sometimes we come up with title, the title explains itself. Independent means it happens when attached to it, it's independent. Academic means it's assigned by your core content teachers and extensions means that it's an extension of, of your work and what you're doing. Now I could have just said asynchronous work. And maybe I should have, I don't know. But that was really the focus point of that. And it's built into the schedule. So every student on a remote day, no matter if you're full remote or hybrid, so every student on their remote day, somewhere in those periods seven through 12 has three sessions of roughly an hour. Um, math and science split 55 minutes, language arts and social studies split 55 minutes, and world language and social emotional learning so that's really done through our um, social workers and guidance counselors. And that may not happen. It may not be work assigned every day, but, but I think that's coming. Um, so students have, will have math twice a week in person. I'm just using math as an example um, for about an hour. And then on each of their days, so twice a week, have up to 30 minutes of math additional work to do. And that is through the independent academic extensions. That work is assigned from their classroom teachers, it's found in Google Classroom, it's graded, it's important and critical to their work. Now, the goal is to not make it be an extension of your homework. So um, if I had Jason as a student today in math class and we went through math, we would our, our typical homework that night that we would always give. And then the next day there'd be some type of independent academic work that they, he would be doing. And the goal is to not make it an, the, more of the, but either new learning, introducing new topics, um, flip classrooms type stuff, so that students come in with a better understanding of what, what they're going to learn next. And some teachers are using that time as a longer range project time that they may not take up as much class time with, but they want kids working on it. So they're working on it during that independent academic extension period. So that's a pretty important part. That's a three hour chunk on a remote day that students have to be working. Um, much like Jason showed his schedule for the remote day and at the bottom they highlighted, um, you know, feel free to change it if you need to. This would be one of those areas for us. We scheduled it, it's scheduled into their schedule so the parents and students can see this is the amount of time and here's the placeholder that you could use to do it. 
Not necessarily have to, but that's what, what we think would be a, a good use of your time. So our students are getting their content area work four days a week. Grade seven through 12 on the, on the hybrid and the full remote kind of continued. And as part of the seven through 12, in addition to what I just talked about, about the extensions, the independent extensions, um, they will meet some courses via Zoom. I think it's really important to have that personal contact daily. Um, so classes that will meet via Zoom will be band, chorus, music, uh, general music, library, gifted and talented, a new class, which we're creating right now, which is called Planning for Success right now, it's seventh and eighth grade. Um, art class, interventions, English language learners, physical education, special education, and coming soon, all students are gonna get an additional block of math enrichment. So that's what they will have via Zoom. Oops, of those courses, um, trimester courses will be library, music, art, and planning for success, and year-long courses. So trimester courses, they might meet twice a week for a trimester. Year-long courses are physical education, band, chorus, GT, intervention, special education, math enrichment. They would, they would probably meet once a week. So students will have some, correct, some direct um, connection via Zoom through the period seven through 12, and it's largely gonna be through their allied arts or support services. We get a lot of questions around, how come you can't just put everything on one place so we can find it? Well, it is on one place, it's in Google Classroom. And we all, from last spring, the feedback was, we really need to just settle in on one, one platform. And Google Classroom, is, uh, Google Classroom is the platform that we have settled in on, and all of our teachers are using that platform. The challenge becomes if a student has five, six, seven teachers, they all have their own Google Classroom. And so they all look slightly different, even though it's Google Classroom. So that becomes some of the challenge. Um, parents can be, can ask to be invited to the Google Classrooms if they would like. They can receive some notifications from teachers. I believe there's some settings where they could get them every time the teacher makes an update. Um, or if they want, they could make it weekly or maybe even after that. But that really is just talking about assignments. And then Zoom will be used for all video conferencing. So again, a common platform, Zoom. Um, this is what we've been working on for the first two days. And I'd say we've, it's been largely successful, but we are finding some, some issues with the Zoom invites. There's a little difference in the way you do it on a, on a laptop to someone receiving it on a laptop apparently. And the way it's hap been happening for us with the iPads. So some teachers are working across grade levels. And I think largely it's been figured out, but um, there, we are still having some problems. So students will be finding a link to their Zoom in their Google Classroom. And in theory, we should be able to push them all out to their calendars. And it should just be a reoccurring Zoom that they're invited to. So that is probably a work in progress for a while longer, but um, it has been really quite successful. And then I'm going to see, yeah, so we got talking today about the academic time. What's the time like? What, what are we gaining or losing compared to a, a, what I would call a typical pre-COVID time? And pre-COVID, those periods one through six that I've talked about, which is really your core content classes, um, they re we, our students would receive 235 minutes per week pre-COVID. Five days a week, that's what they would get, around 47 minutes per class. Now, students are getting 170 minutes per week because they're getting 55 minutes in person twice a week, whether they're remote or hybrid. Plus, they're getting the 30 minutes twice a week for another 60 minutes. So if you can tell there, we're really only about a day off. We're about 60 minutes off from where we were um, before. And I think that's pretty good considering it's a four-day week um, and, and everything that we got going on. So a pretty, I think, similar amount of time. And then for today, I ran around really quickly and tried to find out because it's amazing to go through our school right now. It's actually very, it's a little weird because it's super quiet. <laughs> and at the same time, it's amazing because I walk into some of these teachers' rooms and what, we, what they are doing and what we've asked them to do or what they volunteered to do um, is really quite amazing. And I walked into, uh, if anybody wants to see something amazing, I just, you walk into these remote teachers' rooms and what they have gone around and pillaged for equipment is amazing. It was like a free, you know, thrift swap sale 
or something was going on on the first three days of school and they were taking things. Um, and the people that were the best at it have the most equipment right now, but they clearly, Caitlin Ramsey's room, you go in there and you think you're in Back to the Future movie or something with all the gizmos she has around her computer. But it's, all of these teachers have been working to find out how, how can we include kids in our classes remotely. And we all, just so you know, we have a group of teachers in the building and from home that are reaching out in, in handling remote education for our kids. We also have teachers, because of the numbers, that are teaching some kids in person, and then the next period from that same classroom, they're teaching remotely to a group of kids. So a very different setup and a very different way of teaching. And then we have two situations. We have a language teacher that is teaching from home. She is zooming in and doing their direct instruction to the kids that are in the classroom with another language teacher there to support them and support her technology. So it's amazing what is going on within our building. Um, all in a day and all in a period. So today I just ran around quickly to try to gather some, some information. And there were 388, I only, I only talked to some of them, I didn't get them all. So there were 385 students scheduled to attend a Zoom. So some of that may be the same kid in a math class and then he had to go and attend again in a language arts class. So some of it's the same, the same children. But out of 385 students that were scheduled to attend, the teachers I talked to, 361 attended. So. That's pretty awesome to me. We were able to make contact through Zoom with, I, and I bet there's another 200 students that I haven't got to today, but um, some were delayed, some were kicked out from time to time. Um, and then, but it, it's amazing that on day two, we can have that kind of success. I just, I, just, I was so excited and, and proud of what they've been able to accomplish. Um, and when teachers, I cannot say enough about when we have all these discussions around, why do you need the resources you need? And 20 years ago, you didn't have that position. And 10 years ago and five years ago, without Jonathan Warner in our building, and I'm sure it's the same for the other buildings, the, the tech integrators, this would not happen. Um, so it's just, it's been amazing that we are fortunate enough to have that resource and it's worked really, really well for us. So, so thank you guys for having the foresight and the vision to see that and that need, because without it, this would not work. So. Um, other than that, I think that's about all I have for you. So any questions that you have, I would love to be able to try and answer. Good. All right. Thank you. I'm thank gonna... you for that. I appreciate some of the specific numbers that you were able to share. That was really interesting and powerful to see. So thank you for that, Troy. Yeah, you're welcome. It's really, it's impressive. And I think our teachers just need, I, I really believe that people don't understand. It's almost a different world teaching remotely to being in person. And because you can do one does not necessarily mean the other is easy. And um, the determination and the willingness to accept the challenge to me has just been inspiring from the teachers. So, um, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Come on, come get him, Garth. <laughs> okay, so let me, I'll talk for a little bit about the high school. Um, I don't know. First of all, just a couple of numbers. Um, we have, at last count, 48 students who are 100% remote learning. Um, we have roughly 500 who are hybrid. It's probably a little bit less than that. I didn't check power school for that number, but we're in that vicinity. Um, I do have some pictures, some photographs I'm going to share with you at the end, uh, but most of what I want to do is just sort of talk about the student experience and then I can illustrate it with some pictures at the end of some of our classrooms. Um, so first of all, all of, all of our students, regardless of whether they are hybrid students or 100% remote learning students, they are all in their regular classes with their regular rosters and their regular teachers. Um, so the approach at the high school is different. It's not better or worse. It's really different, less reflective of the different levels um, of and variety of courses that we teach at the high school compared to the other two schools. So 
I mean, why we do that is because of those 48 learners, we've got students in every grade level. We have students in every class level. Um, we have Spanish speakers, we have French speakers, we have kids taking a whole variety of different electives. So it's really not realistic um, to set aside a, a, a cadre of dedicated 100% remote learning teachers. So our approach has been to include all the students, 100% um, remote learners and hybrid learners in, in their regular classes with their regular teachers. Um, so the board will remember that I, I have said um, as an aspiration over the last month or so that the goal was to live connect with our students, regardless of whether they are in school or at home, four days per week. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, engage them in real time teaching and learning. We are not quite there yet, uh, but we are getting closer to that goal at a faster pace than I sort of thought that we would. Um, and teachers are experimenting with a lot of different ways to achieve that goal. Um, it is a completely different, well, it's not a completely different method of teaching, but it, it comes with completely different challenges. Um, I would say that um, completely in-person learning has its challenges, completely remote learning has its challenges, and I would say that trying to teach uh, remote and in school at the same time is the hardest um, for, a, for a variety of reasons. But I'm, I am very proud of our teachers and the work they've done and the progress they've made, um, which I think is, is pretty evident as you walk around the school. Um, tomorrow afternoon, we have our first regular faculty meeting um, and it's entirely devoted um, there are six teacher sort of pioneers, which means that they're like a few inches ahead of other teachers in trying to fully integrate um, in school and remote learners together. Um, so they are leading six different sessions um, and there's two different sessions that they're doing. So there's essentially 12 different sessions and every teacher will be attending two different discussion groups where one of those pioneer teachers is going to share what they're doing and then it's really a kickoff to sort of uh, a sharing and conversation among teachers so that um, folks can learn from one another. Um, I will tell you though that just walking around the school both yesterday and today, I mean virtually every classroom I passed by, you could see remote learners whose pictures whose images were projected through Zoom, using a projector in the classroom onto the screen so that everybody could see them. Um, they were fully contributing um, and their voices were coming over the speakers. They were asking questions. Um, students in class are helping teachers to recognize when students out of class are raising their hands or have added something in the chat thing and they wanna see. So they've been, I think students have been kind of looking out for one another in that way. Uh, and, and it's been good. And, you know, one of the very best features of Zoom are the ability to divide students into breakout rooms, small groups for discussion purposes. Um, and it's, it, it is really neat and powerful that when teachers break students and all the students in their classes into breakout rooms, you'll get some of the kids who are in class talking to the kids who are out of class and doing it over Zoom with headphones in their ears. Um, and it's, it's just a really, really, and, and some of those students are obviously 100% remote learners as well. Um, so it's, it's been a really neat thing. It has absolutely been made possible by Zoom. Um, maybe Google Meet has caught up with that. I know they were hoping that they would. I don't know exactly where they are right now. And getting Zoom for our teachers and for our school district was an expensive proposition, but I will tell you that in my view, it's been it's been investment that's been well, well, well worthwhile. Um, it, it, just the breakout room possibilities make it make it worth everything that was paid for it. Um, so there are some some teachers, and particularly uh, or in classes that are largely or at least partially sort of more hands-on than other classes where teachers are finding sort of middle grounds um, in terms of teaching the students in school, 
um, but then having a part of their class be uh, partially hands-on in class and asynchronous at home. So for example, we have science teachers who are definitely incorporating virtual labs, which all students can engage in at the same time. But we also have science teachers who value, and we all value, the ability to put things, chemicals in beakers and turn on Bunsen burners and do all those, send things down inclined planes and measure things with sensors and all those sorts of things. That sort of experience can't be fully mapped out. So I was talking to Amy DeVries, for example, who's one of our science teachers, um, and she started to use the phrase Groundhog Day. Um, so she fully engages all of her learners at home in school for about half her class. And then on lab days, when she wants to do a physical lab, the students who are at home will have an asynchronous activity to do. The students who are in school will do the lab physically. And then the next day is sort of the groundhog experience of those kids who were um, at home the day before. Now they're doing the lab while other students are getting ready to do that. Um, but Amy, most of her classes, when she's not doing labs, all of her students are involved 100% of the time. Um, in ceramics, uh, just another example, um, Ms. Dewan, who's one of our um, art teachers, um, has sort of concocted out of nothing a uh, uh, fascinating art room, ceramics room. I actually have a photo of it. I want to. I'd like. I think you'll be. You'll appreciate it. Um, she actually begins her class with 10 minutes of, for everybody in school and remote, um, um, doing meditation and mindfulness experiences. Then she does some direct instruction and then all the students and even the students at home have clay materials and some, some equipment that they were, that Jana purchased for them and distributed to them so that everybody is able to engage in ceramics in school at home. The projects at home are a little less sort of sophisticated, I guess. And so at a certain point in class, Jana will say to the remote learners, you can absolutely stay and work with us and I'll answer any questions you have. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can, you can go turn off your camera and do your work on your own and zoom in when you need to. Um, in industrial technology, Jim Ray is, um, has found an interesting middle ground of all the remote learners engage with all the in-school learners in real time over Zoom for instruction at the beginning of the class and then students break out. And what Jim is doing is he's actually created some off-school hours lab experiences so that any student, um, whether they're 100% remote or in school hybrid and on whatever day can come in and get some have some additional lab experiences. Um, physical education teachers are experimenting with the same thing. So for example, tomorrow morning, um, a good number of the PE adventure students are going to Higgins Beach with Mr. Shea um, to do some real hands on things. But in general, the most common experience is that um, Kids at home, kids in class are being engaged in real time by teachers using various technologies. Um, so we do have, uh, right now we have five teachers who are fully remote, teaching their regular classes to their students who are at school and remote. Um, in a month or so that five will grow to seven because two more teachers are gonna switch to remote come early October. Um, and what those students do during the periods when they have class is they go to the gymnasium. Um, they power up their iPads and they connect with their teachers who teach them remotely. Um, and it is quite remarkable actually to go through our gymnasium and see 35 students on their iPads accessing their teachers who are at home. And it is the quietest place in school. It is absolutely remarkable and has been working, I think, well. Um, so that's the approach that we're doing at the high school. Um, I'm proud of the work the teachers have done. I'm super proud of the, uh, the great positive attitude of our students um, in terms of health and safety issues and following all those guidelines. And I would say, knock on wood, it's we're off to a good start. We are learning a lot really fast. I will share some a few pictures. Donna, if you can make me a co-host. Yeah, you're all, you're all set, Jeff. Okay, thank you. So
So these are just a few pictures of Cape Elizabeth High School in remote learning. Um, so first is, and some of the, those of you who are high school parents have seen some of these pictures. Sorry, I'm, I've got to get into the, a different mode of this. Okay, um, so this is some of the some of the directional signals that are in the in the hallway. Um, as you can see, the middle part of the hallway has been black masking taped off um, to indicate that students should should not be walking in the center of the hallway. Um, this is our new cafeteria. <laughs> so the cafeteria is used for students who have study hall. It's used for students who are eating. A lot of our students are eating outside. A lot of our students are going home. Those who are in the grade levels that have permission to go home. Um, so this has sort of become a multi-purpose cafeteria. Uh, but there are definitely students who eat, eat there as well. And certainly as the weather turns, there will be more. This is um, where our students hang out. Um, when they're learning on Zoom from their 100% remote teachers. Um, there's 35 desks in this area, which provides enough space on the other side of the curtain in the gymnasium where Mr. Shea and Ms. Beckel can have their students over there as well, and we're still good with the guidelines. Um, so this is, this is actually Mr. Jordan's classroom, and I, um, so he's a government teacher, and he's got a diagram on his whiteboard of checks and balances. What I was really focusing on is the microphone. Some of our teachers are getting microphones um, to really uh, increase the ability of, we have microphones obviously in our, in our laptops, but they're really not sufficient to pick up for students who are at home hearing students in the classroom and what they're saying and what they're asking. Um, so this is a microphone that Ted has uh, the school has purchased, recently purchased 20 microphones for teachers who are interested in getting those and most of those have been claimed by teachers now and there's some others that are coming as well. But this is, these, having these microphones is really the key to having the students at home be able to participate as full learners through Zoom with the kids who are in their classrooms. Um, this is just, this is looking at uh, Ted Jordan's classroom just to get a sense of the desk arrangements that are happening in the classroom. Um, this is Drew McNeely's class. He's a new math teacher. Um, and this fancy thing right here is a Promethean board. It's a smart board. This is, this is Drew's microphone. Um, it is not part of the Promethean board. It's another microphone that he has, that he purchased and we're obviously reimbursing him for. The amazing thing to me is these microphones are, I would say, almost game changers. And because of what's happened with the price of technology, you can get these to work pretty well for around $30 or even less. Um, so, because none of this would be possible without, uh, without technology, obviously, and without affordable technology. Um, this, this is Kathy Box's classroom. Kathy is a science teacher. Um, so she not only has a microphone, although I didn't take a picture of that, um, all of the teachers have speakers in their classrooms so that when the kids are speaking remotely at home from home, you can loudly hear them, what they're saying and what they're asking uh, because teachers have these speakers. Kathy is also experimenting with having cameras on tripods as a way to allow the students at home to see. Uh, the students in the class. Other teachers are accomplishing the same thing by having the students in class also connect by Zoom, but with their sound down and their volume down so that there's no interference. And they're really just using it as a way for the kids at home to see their classmates. Um, this, is the, this is the now ceramics room, the improvised ceramics room. Um, this was a room of one of our teachers who is now teaching 100% fully remote. Uh, we had to move Jana out of the, um, the normal ceramics room because there is no ventilation in the ceramics room. So it wouldn't be, would not have been safe for either her or the kids to be in there. And she very cleverly has set this room up um, with dividers that she's created. Um, they're not plexiglass, but she's, they're, they're, it's, it's very ingenious to me. Um, so anyway, this is Jana's classroom. Um, 
And this, for any parents of high school students, this is, this is a point of pride, but it's really Jeff Thorak's creation. Um, this is, I think, the only roundabout in this, perhaps nationally in any high school across the nation. So the students, and then this is, those of you who are high school parents will recognize this, the main entrance is back here, the main office off to the right. So basically the kids walk to, well, not just kids, but kids and staff walk to the right, they go around, they go around here, then they go around to the Achievement Center, then they walk over here by the school counseling office. And it's amazing to me that they seem to be having fun doing it. Um, the, the, most of our kids are being really respectful of it and, and uh, not, not cheating. And I've just been super impressed by the, how, how the kids have been engaged. We are probably, um, we are gonna be putting together a little video um, uh, of sort of a more live thing that involves interviews of teachers and interviews of students as well uh, that I hope to be sharing within the next, next couple of weeks with parents. So, so those are some of the just pictures, the images, uh, because I know that parents and even board members haven't really been able to be in the building. So I thought it might be helpful for you to see some of the evidence of what's going on. So now I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Um, I'll ask a question since nobody else is asking. The microphone technology, is it possible to give the ones, the clip-ons you can put on right by your collar and hook it up to your laptops? Um, you could do that. And there are a couple of teachers who actually do have clip-on lapel microphones, Nasser. Um, so that would definitely be a possibility. Getting it for all students would be... Well, number one, it's really hard to get those and that would definitely be, be really expensive. Um, but it does seem so far in initial experiments that even those relatively inexpensive microphones that we've gotten for a lot of teachers seem to be doing a good job of, of um, so like I'm actually teaching a class this year um, and I've got one of those little microphones in the Achievement Center and it took some experimenting today. Today was the first day we really used it. To, I had to get some of the kids who were a little farther away from the microphone to speak up. Uh, I may do some slight changes in seat assignments, uh, but for the most part, kids at home, because they were giving, giving me thumbs up or shaking fingers if, if they weren't able to hear their classmates, but it's, it's quite doable. You just have to do a little bit of problem solving around it, Nasser. Okay. And the floors with the all markings on there, is it more difficult for the custodians to clean the floors and I'm sure they're not uh, buffering anything of that nature, but it's just simple mopping. It, it's so that I'm sure they're not big fans of it, but they understand the reason why it's there. Uh, the that special tape that's designed to be put down on gym floors. Um, so, and, it's, and that does two things. One, it adheres quite firmly. So for example, um, custodians can, can mop and vacuum and sweep over it and the tape for the most part, at least so far, will not come up. And the second thing is that at least what Jeff Thorak tells me is that when the tape is pulled up, it's not, it's designed so it's not supposed to leave residue on the floors when it's picked up. That will remain to be seen when we actually pick it up after a year because we're obviously using it in a different way than it's, it's, it's intended for, but it's been I think really helpful in just visible reminders to students about the importance of physical distancing. And it's been, and, and they've been super respectful of the need to take those things really seriously. And last question, uh, when the students go out to eat, uh, are they picnic tables or they just sit on the grass or are there any teachers following them out to make sure they keep their distance outside as well? So, um, thanks to Public Works, and I don't know where these all came from. I think some of them are relocated from Fort Williams and other public parks. Uh, we have a lot of picnic tables that are all over, all around the school campus. They're very heavily used, but we've been very clear with students that um, they cannot be more than two to a, two to a picnic table um, in order, because they have to stay at least physically six feet apart from one another. Um, so far, um, 
uh, Officer Galvin and I have been the primary people sort of going around every day um, during the lunch hours and separating students. And uh, But I would say that it's becoming increasingly frequently now for me to go up to kids and say, wow, this physical distancing is perfect. Um, like today, I think there was one table that had three students at it and I had to just go up and remind them and they quickly said, yes, that's absolutely, we understand and they changed right away. So, um, so you know, as, as things get colder, obviously, then more kids will be inside, probably in the cafeteria. The cafeteria right now during lunch, because it's nice outside, is pretty quiet. I think today the, there was a dozen kids in there I saw, maybe, maybe 20 at most. Thank you. Kimberly, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, one of my questions was just about lunch and and um, and how how people are faring um, with the cooler temperatures that we've had, and uh, and is there capacity in the cafeteria and whatnot for them. Um, and my other was just a comment that um, I'm always um, so happy to hear that we're taking good advantage of the great resources we have within our town of using the teachers um, that I think you identified as being just a, a half step ahead of the others um, and, uh, and using them as, as resources um, to, you know, build the, uh, share their expertise and, uh, and build the skills of, of all the rest of the teachers. So that is always good news to me. Thank you. Sure, Kimberly. And um, in terms of the lunch capacity issue, um, we've, well, I say we, Nate Carpenter has counted pretty carefully uh, the number of students who are, are um, maroon and gold on seventh periods and how many of them are juniors and seniors. So we are fairly confident that we've got the space that we need even when all or most students are in the building. Uh, we did add a middle lunch period. That was our final tweak to the frequently treat, tweaked schedule um, to add a, a study hall lunch, which has been a tradition at the high school for a while, but for a while we were thinking we could get away without it, but we added it back in just to be on the safe side. Excellent. Thank you. And, um, and to all of you and um, to Dell and his team as well, um, it, it seems like the first, um, you know, a couple of, I, I don't know if we're really a couple weeks in or how we want to qualify this, but it seems like everything has gone quite well. And I appreciate, um, I, I recognize it's so different, uh, a lot of the um, ways of delivering the, the teaching. And I appreciate everyone um, jumping in and trying to figure out creative um, approaches that will be successful and, and keep people safe and learning. So, Thank you. Hope. Hi, yes. I just wanted to make a comment. This is um, applicable really to the high school and the middle school. I just wanted to comment that from, uh, we have three remote learners. So we have a high school student, a freshman, and a eighth grader and a fifth grader. And the first two days so far have been nothing like the spring. I, I want to attest to that there's been full um, full engagement and our house sounds like a call center from 7.55 <laughs> until 2.30. There is just nonstop ac action, basically. Um, so I, I just want to express uh, gratitude for all the work that went into making that an option um, and that um, I appreciate all the work and flexibility that was put into that. Thank you. I will speak for Troy too and say you're welcome. <laughs> it's been a fun challenge. Are there other questions from board members at this point? Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay, Phil. Just to, uh, I know this is very early on. It's early in our third week and we had a rolling period, but are we seeing um, um, attendance? Are we losing anyone? I know that that's a 
that's a real risk at this kind of environment. And, um, and uh, are we seeing any kind of drop off already at this point? And I know it's early, but what do we, you know, keep an eye on, you know, those kids going forward and, and making sure that we can engage with them um, as we see those kind of numbers trickle in. I mean, I, I'll speak for the high school. I'm not sure about the others, but I would say that I think attendance has been very, very strong. Um, we are beginning to see just a little trickle of students having um, symptoms um, and needing to stay home out of an excess of caution. Um, but in terms of students being engaged in classes and attending classes, I think at the high school, I've heard nothing but so far really strong things. I, I, I will say that we did lose unexpectedly about six students to private schools um, where there was an option uh, for students to be in school every single day. Um, not, not a big trend, but that was, it's, it, it was not, it was beyond the norm, I would say. Just, may I follow up in asking since, um, however, you know, students are supposed to stay home when they're, you know, when they're having symptoms, yeah. it keeps popping up around my, my world and neighborhood. Will students have the um, expectation opportunity to uh, zoom in when they're staying home, at least at the high school? And I'm guessing, I'm wondering how it works since we're asking students to do that. And um, knowing that they're supposed to do that may also <laughs> curb their enthusiasm for staying home if they're um, likely to kind of use that as, a, as an excuse. So, so in terms of the high school, if they're staying home just because they're being, be, they're being necessarily cautious because of symptoms, but they're well enough to participate in classes, they could absolutely participate and I would expect them to participate in classes. Um, that wouldn't be any different than our 100% remote learners or our maroon kids on gold days. Um, obviously, if they're not well, uh, then we wouldn't expect students to participate in classes, but they fully could if they're home just because they have to be, uh, just to be safe for everybody. How would that work at the other schools? Yeah, so I, I think it would be a little more of a challenge and we have actually started those conversations now that we've kind of got a baseline of school up and running. Um, so I think that Wednesdays would become a, a pretty important part of that for the people. Um, and it would definitely be a Zoom time available for teachers to reach out to those students. Um, I think that we're gaining expertise. I know that I could go and have many more teachers now be willing to try a Zoom um, live from the room. So I think that if it was one or two kids here or there, we would definitely try to push out synchronously that opportunity. If all of a sudden we had 10 or 12 kids in many different grade levels, then it may become much more of an asynchronous kind of learning for them. Um, in the event that maybe they could join a fully remote class for some things, if they're in a similar place, say in seventh grade math with a fully remote team, they, I may, we may be able to offer that to them, that for a little while you can join that team and you'd get that live instruction. Um, so we're, we're kind of working around those areas, trying to, trying to meet that need. It sounds like, parents would need to reach out so you could kind of work out that individualized plan? Yeah, I think parents would need to reach out and Jill would definitely know in my school. Um, you know, I would know who was staying home and why. And, you know, she, I'm sure she would be a big support in facilitating that with us. Yeah. Jason, did you wanna, oh, am I muted? No. no okay, got it. Did you want to, are you able to speak to that or? Sure, sure. So, I mean, of course it does pose a challenge. So we've, what we've talked about is, um, you know, it depends on the, the particular case and how long a student would be out. Um, so we would go for what we have now as a draft plan is that, um, you know, five or less days, we would um, have 
the teacher working with the student and families to kind of keep, keep up with the assignments as long as they could. Um, over five days, we would start talking about um, assigning someone to, to the student, like for perhaps one of our educational technicians to connect live with that student um, when the teacher is not able to and kind of facilitate the process. And then depending on how long they're out, I mean, there's always an option to transfer to a fully remote class, but that would be one of the last options to really change program. Um, so we have lots of ideas and we have some draft plans, uh, but it really would be about working with the families. Um, you know, can the student even participate in the work, but if they're just out quarantined and they're asymptomatic, then we would use our resources and, and assigned resources to make sure that they could um, keep up with the pace of the class. I, I just wanted to thank all of you. And it's apparent that the solutions really, you know, kind of fit the, the grade level and the ages of the students. And um, so I hope that everybody that's been asking these questions will <laughs> watch the recording of this Zoom and, and know how this is going because it sounds really good and thank you. Uh, Kimberly, you have your hand raised. Is that from before or do you have another comment or question? Oh, that's from before. I'm sorry, I'll put it down. Okay, no worries. I think it's just important for people to know that this is all evolving and um, you can hear already at the high school they've been you know working with these things just a few weeks and have already worked out some kinks and have some ideas and I know the middle school and elementary school as well so um, I think as we the longer we're in school the better we'll get at all of this and the more ideas um, people will come up with and um, we'll share those ideas. So uh, I think this is really evolving. We, we're off to a great start, but it's still evolving. Yeah. Um, I would like to share that um, my students in the high school, so I have the high school experience right now, not middle school or Pine Cove. Um, they're definitely talking about, just to follow up on Hope's comment, um, that it's very, that it's different than last year. Um, that that it, they're working hard and that being home is is not the same as it was last year it's definitely there's been a shift from emergency ro remote learning to um real serious learning happening um from home and it's it's difficult to navigate that they're, they're working on it you know they're they're not gliding through this as easily as they did in the spring um i hope that um it, it's exhausting. I can only imagine having been a teacher for eight years and having a sister-in-law who's a teacher um, in another district, uh, the balancing act that teachers are playing right now um, and the, the effort that it takes to manage so many different pieces. Um, so I hope that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make it sustainable as best we can um, as well as provide for the students. It's a really tricky balance. Um, but, um, you know, I just want to say thank you to all of you teachers who are uh, putting that effort out. And let's just keep those, you know, as things are evolving, Donna, let's keep those conversations going a little bit, right? Um, because we need, we need it all to work on from all aspects for sure. Yeah. So um, are there any other comments? I just also want to say that the PPE continues to come in. I have numbers here and they're just quite staggering. Like we've gotten 2,000 pairs of large gloves and 6,974 cloth face coverings and the, the list goes on, but thousands and thousands of items of PPE are coming in and we're distributing, distributing them um, to the school. So. Uh, we are in pretty good shape right now with our PPE and more, more keeps coming. So we're very fortunate. Great. Is there anything else from 
board members or anything else that administrators would like to share? All right. I'd like to I, thank everybody, Heather, all the, yeah. all the parents out there who um, are taking this all so seriously and um, doing the daily screenings and the staff as well who are doing their, their daily screenings and uh, taking those symptoms um, really seriously. Jeff's talked about some students and some staff members as well who are experiencing symptoms and um, instead of pushing through and coming to school, they are staying home, which is really what, what we need everybody to be doing. So um, just like to thank everybody for all their efforts in, in keeping our kids uh, in, in our buildings. Yeah. I would ditto that completely. It's, it's a great united effort here for sure. Um, I think that can conclude the meeting. Let people end a little bit early, go home, get some rest and dinner, some sleep, whatever you need. Um, thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you so much. And thanks for all everybody's doing. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. Keep up all that great work. Take care. Bye -bye.